Hey everyone, Janie here. Welcome back to my garden and welcome to my week eight Master Gardeners training recap. It is absolutely pouring outside. It is just one of those days. I've got my hair up and I actually have sweats on. <laughs> so it's just one of those days. I am in my office slash uh, seed starting room and you can see I have fungus gnats like pretty bad. I've put these yellow traps up and they kind of filled up with fungus gnats. It's so frustrating. I just haven't been good about um, staying on top of my uh, my mosquito bits. This is how I usually, I usually bottom water and then I put mosquito bits into the water to, to keep the fungus gnat population down. And I just haven't been on top of it and I am definitely seeing the, the consequences of not being on top of it. So like, I know how to fix it. I know how to handle it. It's just, it's very frustrating. <laughs> you know, it's just, I'm just, I'm ready for it to be spring so I can get all these, these seedlings outside and hardening off and kind of get things going and get these fungus gnats out of my office. It's very frustrating. All right, so on to the recap. This week's class, or I should say last week's class, because I have classes on Fridays and then I give myself like a day to like, uh, absorb all the information before I sit down and I actually talk about it. So today's actually Sunday. It's just, you know, it's just one of those cozy little Sundays. The girls are watching a movie and, you know, we're all just relaxing inside. But I wanted to come in here and I wanted to film this while everything was still pretty fresh in my mind. I have notes, so I'm going to be referring to that because it was a little technical of a class. The topic today or Friday was integrated pest management, which I've actually done a video before on integrated pest management. I did it uh, last year, so it's probably not the, the most quality video. <laughs> I've started watching some of my videos from way back from, from last year when I first started doing uh, YouTube and it's, oh, it's, you know, I just can't watch them. I was watching my, um, my April garden tour and my, my uh, filming quality, you know, it's just, it, you learn a lot in a year, basically. So bear with me if you go watch one of those videos. I will link it up here, my IPM video, um, and then I'll talk about it a little bit more today as well. The other topic that we went over in Master Gardeners was also sustainable landscaping. And my thought, my impression of the class was it was going to be divided into two. It was going to be like the first half of the class, we were just talking about sustainable landscaping. And then the second half of the class, we were just talking about integrated pest management. And I didn't think there would be any overlap. And I was totally wrong. And I didn't realize it until they actually got into the information and started talking about it. And the two, the two presenters were uh, extremely knowledgeable and obviously had worked together before, um, you know, because they kind of overlapped in their presentation. It was really, really interesting. And so I'm excited to share it with all of you. So the first thing I do want to say, I just, you know, um, I'm trying to think of how I want to say this um, without offending anybody or uh, not showing how important this is. You know, we we all care about the environment. We all care about keeping our world healthy and our gardens healthy and doing the best thing. Um, but I also don't want to take any of this as like, um, like I'm shaking my finger at anybody or wagging my finger at anybody or anything that we do. Like we all try our best. And I think that learning the reasoning behind the, the purpose of doing things, I think is probably the best way that we can change our actions. Right. Um, and so I don't even, you know, I've learned all of this stuff and there, you know, I'm going to try my best, but I'm not going to go gung ho and try and be, um, uh, exclusive for gardening, I guess is that's how I want to say it. Like, I'm never going to say, oh, shame on you for using that or, or you shouldn't do that. I'm never going to say that to you guys because I don't, you know, I feel like we're all learning and our, we're all, um, making the best decisions that we can. Uh, and, and again, I think that that education is the best way to go about that. So I just feel really strongly about that. I do watch, um, I watch things, you know, on Instagram and YouTube and I see a lot of like shaming almost like people shaming other people for, for choosing to do things a certain way. And I just feel like that's so sad because gardening is such a fantastic 
hobby or a thing to do or I mean it's just such a fantastic thing that I think that we should like be opening opening our arms and welcoming every single person and never shaming anybody so I don't want you guys to think that what I'm saying here is in any way shaming or saying oh you can't use this product or you can't use this um, because it's not like that it's just educating ourselves and learning what a better option might be and and maybe that will work for you so I just wanted to say that no shaming going on here at my channel ever like that is my goal for this channel for dig plant water repeat is that I just want to welcome every single gardener with open arms and you know if somebody plants one plant then you know I've I've hit my goal so Okay, so having said that, I just I just wanted to say that. Let's get started with IPM or integrated pest management. So I'm gonna read this because I wrote it down um, and I, I feel like I can't paraphrase it. So IPM is a decision-making process that is science-based and looks at the garden as a whole. The goal is to choose the least toxic control. And when we're talking about IPM, when you say the word control, that's basically something that you're doing in the garden to manage manage the pest. Like that is an action that you're taking in the garden. So there are four different types of controls that they talk about in with IPM. And that is cultural controls, physical controls, biological controls, and chemical controls. And those go in order from least toxic to most toxic. Obviously, chemical controls will be most toxic. So the goal with IPM is to start off with cultural controls and see if you can manage the problem with cultural controls. And then you kind of go down the list um, just, just to see where you can manage the problem. And the goal is, is to manage the problem to the point of your threshold. Everybody threshold is different. Like, uh, for instance, if you're growing tomatoes, some people might be okay with eating a tomato that maybe has a little piece chewed out of it. Another person might not be okay with that at all and want a perfectly beautiful tomato that a pest hasn't touched at all. So all of us have our own threshold and it's just a matter of following the IPM control flow to get yourself, get your garden to the point where your threshold is appropriate. And something that, um, that they pointed out, which I thought was really interesting was you need to think about your threshold. If your threshold is to have absolutely zero pests in your garden, you're also going to have absolutely zero uh, natural predators or beneficial bugs because what they eat is they eat the pests in your garden. So having your goal, um, it's not smart to have your goal of zero zero percent aphids in your garden because then you're going to have no ladybugs, right? So then if any aphids do come to your garden, then you won't have any ladybugs to eat them, right? So it's kind of like a really, it's a really important balancing act and I don't think that there's a single answer for anything. It's just something to think about that maybe you don't want your goal as perfection because everything is in balance, everything is in flow um, and it's, you know, it's nature. It's, <laughs> we can't control everything. All right, so let's get started with the first control, the least toxic control in IPM, and that is cultural controls. And so this is obviously the first thing that you want to do uh, in your garden, get your garden as healthy as possible so that when those pests inevitably do come, your garden is ready to deal with the aphids, deal with the white flies, deal with the ladybug or not ladybugs, slugs and snails and Japanese beetles and all that kind of stuff. So the first item in cultural controls that you need to think about is obviously your soil health and your soil health the goal is the healthier the soil the healthier the garden the healthier the garden the less stress the plants and the less stress the plants the less susceptible to pest pressure they're going to be under so you go back and you want to start with healthy soil as much as possible and the key the takeaway for all of this is adding compost or organic matter is absolutely the goal because organic matter in our gardens means live, healthy soil that's going to take care of the plants. So the goal for organic matter, the percentage in your soil is you want to have at least 5% organic matter in your soil. And here in California, you know, I'm taking a California Master Gardeners class, so I don't know about anywhere else, but here in California, we average about 2% organic matter in our soil, just naturally. So adding organic matter, adding compost is huge, absolutely huge. So you basically can never add 
enough organic matter basically and it's just going to help you out and adding that organic matter or that compost to your garden is actually going to help prevent pests in the long run so it's a really really good thing to do the other thing you want to think about is and this is one of those situations where i'm not judging anybody but organic fertilizers versus synthetic fertilizers we have to think back or think you know down organic fertilizers the way that they work is that they feed the soil and then the soil can subsequently feed the plants that's why organic fertilizers take longer to work than synthetic fertilizers synthetic fertilizers completely skip the soil part and they just automatically go to feed the plant that's why when you're giving you know like miracle grow or um, even like the proven winners um, uh, water soluble uh, plant food. That's why when you give it to your supertunias, like literally the end of the day, the supertunias are like, oh, thank you. And, you know, looking all beautiful and blooming. That's because that food, that fertilizer automatically works on the plants. But what that's not doing is that's not feeding the soil health. And so it's not a long term thing. And that's why when you use those water soluble synthetic fertilizers, you have to repeat it every single week. You know, in the gardening season, I fertilize my supertunias every single week because it's a synthetic fertilizer. Now, if I, um, if I focused on organic fertilizers and increasing the health of the soil, then maybe I wouldn't have to fertilize with synthet synthetic fertilizers as often. I hope that that, that makes sense. So again, I'm not going to stop using my uh, synthetic fertilizers on supertunias because my goal in my garden is to have big, beautiful blooms, you know, at certain times of years. So, um, you know, I will, I will work on my soil health. Absolutely. But you know, it's not an all or nothing thing. It's something that I have to remember organic fertilizers when I can choose that is really good. So sure start EB stone sure start is a wonderful organic fertilizer. And the point of sure start, which I use whenever I plant any of my plants is going to help feed the soil. So, you know, choosing something like that is is absolutely doing you know doing this IPM cultural control so just kind of think of it like that the next action in uh, cultural controls is watering appropriately and like you have to again this is another something that you have to take all the way down to like like basically break it down so when you're watering appropriately and really the key to this is watering uh, deeply and less frequently. So imagine all those roots, right? If you only water the top couple inches of the soil, the roots are gonna stay up at the top, top couple inches of the soil because that's where the water is, right? If you water deeply and infrequently, then those roots are gonna be searching for the water and they're gonna grow down and, and um, develop their root system much more than that plant that you say water every single day for five minutes, right? So watering like two or three times a week for 20 minutes versus watering every day for five minutes, you want this option because you want the roots as developed as possible on said plant. So then if there is a, uh, a heat event, if it's, or even just on a regular basis, you know, if you have this plant over here that has a really shallow root system and you water and it's a hot day and that water dries up by the, you know, by, by noon or something like that, then that plant over there is going to get really stressed out. It's going to get dried out. And then because it's a stressed plant, because it's dried out and it's thirsty, it's going to be stressed and susceptible to pests. But then if you look over this plant over here that has a very developed root system and the roots go way down into the ground, that water isn't going to evaporate by noon like it is over here. And that water is not going to be thirsty halfway through the day. And so then it will be able to handle the heat stress a lot better. It won't be a stressed plant and it won't be as susceptible to pests. Also, the other thing to think about about watering appropriately is watering at the right time. And I know I've talked about this many times before, but thinking about watering at sunset, no, wrong. Watering at sunrise, it, the water is going to dry up on the leaves and the ex excess, you know, the other areas. So slugs and snails won't be as happy. So watering at the right time might actually help your slugs and snails. And I think back on last year, I used to water at night. I used to water at sunset. Um, I would like turn my drip system on at sunset and I dealt with slugs and snails in earwigs so much. So that is definitely changing this year. And hopefully that will help with my slugs, snail and earwig problem. All right, and then finally, the last action in cultural controls is choosing the right plants. 
if you live in a really hot environment or a really wet environment or whatever it is, you want to get the, uh, the environmentally appropriate plants there because those are going to be less stressed. So for instance, here in Northern California in zone 9B, we have weeks on end of triple digits. If it feels like it's not always weeks on end, but it feels like it's really hot. So if I was to plant a ton of plant like azaleas or, or hydrangeas, you know, that cannot handle that heat. Those plants are going to be super, super stressed in the summer when we have heat. And it's, again, a stressed plant is susceptible to pests. So choosing the right plants as much as you possibly can to, um, to decrease the amount of stressed plants in your garden is going to help with your pest management. Okay, sorry, I had to take off my sweater. I normally have a fan that runs in this room, this closet, really, because I have all these grow lights and then I have this ring light that I use for filming and <laughs> it's just so hot in here. It's absolutely, I am like sweating right now. So I just had to change into a t-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> all right, so now moving on to the next control for IPM. The next one down the list is physical controls. And this is a pretty easy one. We kind of all know this. This is something like, um, row covers, bird netting, gopher baskets. If you have gophers, it's basically putting something into your garden to change the setup of your garden to keep the pests out. Now, again, this might not always work because if like, say you have tomatoes and you put row covers over your tomatoes, well, not only is that going to keep out all the bad bugs, but it also keeps out all the good bugs. So you might have blossom drop, you know, you might lose all your blossoms and then never develop any tomatoes because that tomato plant never got pollinated. So, you, you know, not every control works perfectly and you can't just go and you can't just cover your whole garden with row covers, but it's something to think of. You might want to cover your garden with row covers when a particular bug is most prevalent, right? Um, so it's just something to think about. Physical controls are kind of the next step. So you have birds like I do, you know, you get cloches to cover it to keep the birds away instead of I don't know. I don't think anybody poisons birds, but you know what I mean, right? Just, just to keep the birds away or to keep the gophers away or, you know, something like that. And this might not work for everybody, right? So say you're my parents and they have gophers in their garden, unfortunately, really bad. And, um, I planted a bunch of super tunias in my mom's garden last year and gophers came in looking for food and they, they decimated all those super tunias. And you can't put gopher baskets, you know, all over her garden. So she has to find another control to deal with the gophers rather than using a physical control that might help protect one plant, but in her situation, it's not enough, right? Um, but when you're looking at IPM, you want to start with the top and work down to the bottom to see what is the least amount of, um, of intervention you can do to take care of the issue. All right, so the next control for IPM is biological controls. And I actually find this one super interesting because um, this is kind of, uh, this is kind of like changing nature, you know, in, in your garden in a way. So biological controls are when you're introducing something into your garden that wasn't there before, right? And it could be like going to the garden center and purchasing one of those tubs of ladybugs or lace wings and putting them into your garden to, you know, for the ladybugs and the lace wings to eat aphids, right? And so that is a biological control. You're not introducing any toxicity or anything like that, but you are introducing other things into your garden that weren't there before. But it can also be something like planting pollinator-friendly flowers to attract pollinators to then eat the bugs, right? Or deal with the bugs. So it can be something like that. It doesn't have to be you going to the store and purchasing uh, you know, natural predators, it, it could be planting beneficial flowers, which is actually a very, very good way, um, to increase the diversity of your garden and thus increase the health of your garden. It can also be something like adding a water fountain, which is going to attract more birds. And then the birds are going to eat the caterpillars, um, you know, or like the budworms right, that are eating your super tunias. So having more birds, having more natural predators is obviously going to help with the biological control of the 
pests in your garden. All right, now say you've gone through, you've gone through the cultural controls, you've gone through the physical and the biological controls, and you're still having a huge problem with whatever pest you're dealing with in the garden. That is when you move on to the chemical controls. And there is a place for chemical controls in your garden. You just have to do it responsibly and understand what's going on. The first thing is you have to identify the correct pest. That is, that is step number one, right? So, um, lots of people, myself included, <laughs> did not know, do not know what ladybug larvae look like. Ladybug larvae are scary looking. They look like a bad pest in the garden. So if you don't know, and all of a sudden you see ladybug larvae, and then you see, um, you know, damage to your plants, like curling leaves or anything like that, and you think, oh, well, it must be these things that are causing the damage to this plant, right? And because you didn't understand that the ladybug larvae were actually eating the aphids that were causing the damage to that those plants, you were messing that whole system up. So it's really important to have the right identification of the pest so that you understand what you're doing. Now, that example was very, um, uh, like elementary, right? I know a lot of us know what ladybug larvae look like, but there's a lot of other situations just like that that it's really important to identify the pest. So there are two main websites that I think are really, really great for identifying pests. And that first one would be the University of California IPM program. I talked about this in my IPM uh, video that I made last year, but this is through the University of California and it basically stepped, takes you through a step-by-step -step questionnaire like, um, does the bug have wings? Is it crawling bug? What, do the, what does the damage on the plant look like? And it helps you identify the pest or the fungus or, you know, or whatever um, uh, to be able to deal with that appropriately to, you know, because identification is key. The other website is, um, and I uh, learned this in my class on Friday, it's called bugguide.net. And I looked on it and it was pretty cool because it has like pictures of bugs and you can kind of click on and be like, it kind of looks like that one. And then it takes you, you know, um, further so that you can identify the proper bug. Then once you've identified the pest that is harming your garden, then you need to choose the right type of toxic control or chemical control to deal with it. And it was really interesting they kind of gave a really easy guide for how to know what type of product to use. So when you have sucking pests like aphids, white flies, scale, mealybugs, just as an example, you want to use some type of insecticidal soap because an insecticidal soap will work on the sucking nature of those type of pests. Um, chewing pests like slugs, snails, or caterpillars, you want to use Bt, Bacillus thuringiensis, uh, something with spinosad or something Something with iron phosphate. Those are all, all going to help prevent the chewing nature of those pests that are causing the damage in your garden. And finally, crawling pests like ants, spider mites, or Japanese beetles, you want to use something like diatomaceous earth. And I guess the diatomaceous earth gets into the exoskeleton of those crawling pests and uh, dehydrates them so they die. So, um, and diatomaceous earth is pretty, I mean, it's pretty non-toxic. Non so understanding what type of pest you're dealing with, then you can target them directly without using one of those um, pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, you know, the, um, I'm blanking on the word right now, but they basically kill everything because that is going to mess up you know, that's gonna kill the ladybug larvae along with the aphids, right? And that's gonna mess up your soil and all that kind of stuff. So you wanna avoid something like that. You wanna target the pest directly when you're using some type of chemical control. All right, so I hope I explained that um, appropriately, the IPM. I really do think IPM is the way to go. If we can kind of start thinking about our gardens um, in an IPM manner, I think, and that includes thinking about this, the pest situation before it gets out of control, absolutely before it gets out of control. So dealing with the cultural controls first in the beginning, like when you're planting a plant, using the organic Sure Start or something like that to, to get that plant um, and that soil around that plant as healthy as possible uh, later on in the season, you'll most likely have less plants, less pests on that plant because that plant and the soil around that plant is going to be healthier. So um, I do think IPM is a really, really good way to go. Um, 
the presenters were kind of saying like, okay, um, you know, you have ants in your garden. Ants is one of your pests. Well, think about how many ants there are just in California, right? California alone. You are not going to kill all the ants in California. So taking an ant spray and spraying ants, that's just going to kill the ants at that moment, right? But there's millions and billions and billions of ants. And so they're just going to come back and you're going to have the problem again. And you're going to have the problem again. And you're going to have the problem again. Um, so it's just something to think of is that like, you're not going to kill all the pests um, by attacking the pest directly. So you kind of want to manage the problem from the beginning. And so then it doesn't bother you and it doesn't exceed your threshold for, for, um, for handling the pests in your garden. Uh, because the other way of going straight to the pests, it, I mean, it just, it just doesn't work. All right, then that brings me to the next part of class, and that was the sustainable landscaping portion. And again, I thought that there was no overlap at all uh, with these two, with sustainable landscaping and IPM. And actually, there was tons of overlap because, again, if you have a healthy garden, if you have healthy soil, that leads to less pests. If you have a sustainable garden, that means you have healthy soil and healthy plants, and therefore it means less pests. So a healthy, sustainable garden is the goal for every gardener because it's just going to make our lives that much easier. The other thing I do want to point out, um, and, and it is a problem, is our, our water treatment facilities um, are not advanced enough to be able to uh, treat any type of pesticide that is in the water. So basically, when we have a pesticide, when we spray those ants with ant spray or anything like that, those pesticides are getting into our, our water, our wastewater, and then the wastewater goes to the water treatment facilities, and the water treatment facilities can do nothing about it. Basically, those pesticides stay into the water, and then it goes into the ocean or goes into the rivers, and, and, um, and it kills the good fish or the good birds or the good bugs, and then it kind of just continues continues messing up that natural cycle that we have. So the goal ultimately with IPM and then the goal with sustainable landscaping is to decrease the pesticide use or the toxicity use because it actually is messing up absolutely everything and making gardening harder for us. All right, so for sustainable landscaping, they talked about seven different components of sustainable landscaping that all work together. Those components are landscaping locally, I'll go into these after I say them, landscaping locally, less to the landfill, conserving water, conserving energy, protecting water and air quality, creating wildlife habitat, and then uh, nurturing the soil. So first, let's talk about landscaping locally, which is picking the right plant for your area. And this, I hate this one because the grass is always greener on the other side. And I want the plants, uh, you know, that um, Steph from Hooked and Rooted over in, I think she's in Connecticut or Massachusetts. I want the plants that she has, right? Because I find them beautiful and I'm used to all the plants that I have in my area. Um, and you know, a, a purple fountain grass or a Chinese fringe flower is like so common here or a day lily. That's a good example. A day lily is so common here. I don't want a day lily in my garden. I want a, a big leaf hydrangea or something like that. And so you know, I understand that and I'm, I'm right there and I want all the other type of stuff in my garden, but you have to think of how much energy and how much, uh, stress goes into trying to find those plants for your garden. For instance, if I have a big leaf hydrangea, I have to make sure that I shade it, right? I have to make sure that I acidify the soil. So, you know, I'm putting other amendments into the soil that shouldn't be there. Um, it's going to be stressed. So it's going to be susceptible to pests. So I'm going to have to spray pesticides or, you know, whatever, um, onto that, onto that hydrangea. Um, you know, there's all these things. Oh, and I'm going to have to water it a ton. Um, uh, just to make sure that it stays hydrated here in our heat. So I'm not saying that I'm not going to plant a big leaf hydrangea, but I have to understand what comes with wanting to plant a plant that doesn't really thrive in my area. So if I have two plants and they're both pretty similar, right? So maybe like this is, this is a stretch, but a limelight hydrangea or a panicle hydrangea versus a big leaf hydrangea. Big leaf hydrangeas, 
they don't do well with hot, dry environments. Panicle hydrangeas can handle it a little bit better. So this panicle hydrangea is going to need less energy and less intervention to thrive in my garden versus a big leaf hydrangea. So that's kind of what they're talking about when they say uh, landscape locally is pick the, the best choice plant for your garden because that is going to be a sustainable landscape. Okay, the next component of sustainable landscaping is less to the landfill. And we understand this, right? Like waste not, want not reduce, reuse, recycle, all that kind of stuff. But think about the amount of energy it takes to control the size of a plant that's not meant to be there, right? So say you want a Laura Pedlum, say you want a Chinese fringe flower, but you only have a space that's two feet two feet by two feet, right? Well, normally, like certain sizes of Chinese fringe flower can get up to five feet. So if you choose a five foot size Chinese fringe flower and you try and put it in a space that only has enough room for a two foot size Chinese fringe flower, you are gonna have to prune that Chinese, that five foot Chinese fringe flower twice a year, every year. It's gonna take a lot of energy. It's gonna be stressful for the plant. Um, you know, it's not, it's not a sustainable plant to go in that two foot spot. Whereas if you choose something, a two foot sized Chinese fringe flower and put that two foot sized Chinese fringe flower in that two foot spot, you're not gonna have to prune that plant. You can just leave it there. It will be happy. It will be less stressed. It will be much more sustainable for your landscape. So that's what they're trying to say when they say uh, less to the landfill is choosing the right plant for your spot where you don't have to constantly prune on it and spend all that energy um, trying to make it into something that you want it to be. All right, next component is conserving water. And this is this is easy. This is a piece of cake. This over overlaps with IPM. Don't water every day. <laughs> you know, water uh, deeply and less frequently because that is going to establish the root system of your plants and that is going to make it so that plant doesn't need to constantly be watered and then you have runoff and then you have wasted water and all that kind of stuff. So I know I'm repeating myself here, but the point is, is that there's a lot of overlap with all of these, um, these thought processes and these techniques for gardening. And overall, it's going to help you in the long run. It's not so much, you know, it's great to think about the environment, but some, you know, I'm not out there in my garden always thinking like, how can I be environmentally sound, right? Because then I would have an all native garden that I never had to water and it just, it wouldn't, it wouldn't um, feed my soul because that's not the type of garden that I want. But if I have my big leaf hydrangea, if I water it deeply, then I'll know that I'm, I'm expanding that root system and then I won't have to water that as much as I would if I, if I watered it shallowly. I hope that makes sense. All right, then we have conserving energy. And again, there's more overlap here. Okay, so for one thing, conserving energy, planting shade trees. When we lived in the town over, we lived in Woodland, they have this program. I just don't know if they have this in Davis, but they have this program where they will come out and they will plant a shade tree in your garden for free because as that shade tree grows up and it shades your south facing windows, you're going to need less use of your air conditioner because your house is going to stay cooler because you've used your garden to, um, to conserve energy. So I just thought that was such a fantastic program. I actually signed up for it and was on the waiting list to get a shade tree planted in my garden in my home that I lived there, but then we ended up moving, so I never actually went through it. But check your... Um, you know, check check your city, check your town and see if they have something like that because how cool, you get an absolutely free tree, you gotta choose it yourself, I gotta choose it myself, and um, and you could have a free tree that help could help you conserve energy. So then another, you know, taking this a step further, making sure that you shade the areas that, um, that are concrete because concrete uh, uh, reflects heat, which makes everything hotter. Um, so shading those areas with either shade trees or pergolas or something like that. And then also shading your air conditioner unit, which I actually don't do right now, but I will do. So stay tuned for later this week. Um, shading your air conditioner unit is also going to help conserve energy and that air conditioner unit won't have to work as hard in the summer. But take conserving energy a step further and think back to when I was talking about less for the landfill and choosing the right size plant for your area. If you choose a plant, if you choose that four to five foot Chinese fringe flower and you have to spend energy to prune that fringe flower every single year 
twice a year maybe, say you're one of those people that use one of those gas powered pruners. So you're basically using your gas powered pruners to prune, to, you know, to prune that Chinese fringe flower, where if you just chose the right fringe flower, uh, Chinese fringe flower plant, you wouldn't have to use all that energy. So it all kind of works together. It all, you know, it's just making the right decisions and thinking about the consequences of the, t of the decisions that you do make. Then we have protect our water and our air quality. And I kind of already talked about this um, in that water treatment facilities as of right now have no way to get pesticides out of the water. Uh, so adding pesticides or um, even having runoff, right? So you think about if you water your lawn too much, I talked about this in my lawn watering video. If you water your lawn too much, you are causing runoff and that runoff goes into our drainage system and then that goes immediately immediately out to, you know, whatever waterway is closest to you. But you have to think the soil is our best filter that we can possibly have. So the soil, when water goes through the soil, uh, that soil will capture the fertilizers, capture the pesticides, capture whatever junk is in that water, and then that water can go down to our water table and be reused again. When the water's not going through the soil, all of that junk is not getting filtered out of that water and all of that junk is going into our oceans and our rivers and our lakes and all that kind of stuff. So the goal is, is to get your water to the filter, to the soil as much as possible, right? And there's different ways that you can do that, but having something like a dry creek bed where you have, you know, kind of rocks all in an area, um, that is gonna allow the water to soak down into the soil. The soil can filter out all the contaminants and you're just keeping everything healthy, plus you're keeping the water where you need it to be, which is in your area, not out to the oceans. Okay, then number six is creating wildlife habitat. Again, this overlaps with IPM. This is biological controls. If you plant uh, pollinator fr friendly flowers and pollinator friendly plants in your garden, you are going to attract the good bugs and it's going to have you uh, maintain a sustainable garden because those good bugs are going to eat the bad bugs and then the bad bugs aren't going to ruin your garden. It all overlaps. Guys, I am so hot right now. <laughs> I am sure I'm like so sweaty at this point. I'm just, oh. <laughs> I, I don't want to turn on the air conditioner in my house, but goodness, these lights are killing me. All right, and then the last component of sustainable landscaping is nurturing the soil. Again, this overlaps with IPM, but one of the things the presenters said that I thought was really, really interesting is um, kind of think, of, think of the soil as your body and think of it as your health, right? And so if you use something like a synthetic fertilizer on your soil, it's basically giving your body a donut. It gives you the energy, right? But it gives you this unhealthy, sugar-laden energy that's not going to do good things for your body. Whereas if you give your body an apple, right? That is the good energy. That's that's creating really good building blocks in your body. And in the long run, your body's gonna be healthier and work better, function better. So kind of think of that when you're nurturing your soil for a sustainable landscape. If you have healthy soil, you're gonna have healthy plants and you're gonna have a healthy garden. So that is it for today's Master Gardener's Recap. Lots and lots of overlap, but the point is, is that a healthy garden is a good garden that is going to be sustainable. It's going to be good for the environment. And actually it's going to be better for you because it's going to keep the bugs away. So instead of just re you know, going to the store and reaching for a pesticide or an herbicide or anything like that, think of what other things that you could do that might make it a little bit better for your garden in the long run. It's just something, you know, it's something to understand and to educate ourselves with. Um, just so that we're not doing the immediate reaction, which is spraying something. So I appreciated all of this. Uh, it was really interesting to learn all of this. It was, I feel a lot more um, equipped to be able to make correct decisions. And it's basically just thinking of the consequences of all of our actions. Even getting ladybugs and putting them in the garden is going to have a consequence. And what is it? Is it a good consequence? Is it a bad consequence? All that kind of stuff. So anyway, I just want to say, I think that this is very helpful, but again, I am not shaming anybody. If you choose to use neem oil, that's fine. <laughs> you know? That's kind of like a big thing that's been going around like the past year or two is like how bad neem oil is. And like, 
yeah, neem oil is bad, but it's better than some other options. And maybe if you've gone through and you've tried the cultural controls and tried the biological controls and it hasn't worked. And so then you do have to use neem oil. Don't shame anyone for using neem oil. It's just kind of, kind of how I think about it. So let me know if you have any questions in the comment section below. I appreciate all of you watching this. Um, hopefully it will stop raining so I can get out into my garden. Tomorrow I am posting my February backyard garden tour, which I filmed last Last week before the rain started so I am prepared for that uh, but then come Wednesday I might be working might be working in my garage or something like that so I hope you all enjoyed this and I hope you all have a chance to get in your garden today okay now I'm turning the fan on